Okay, so I think we're going to get going. So again, welcome to the Science of Learning session. And uh, it is an honor to be presenting our first speaker. Um, this will be Dr. Loretta Brancaccio Terrace, and she will be um, speaking regarding her Karski Foundation Distinguished Undergraduate Teaching Award that she has just received. Uh, her, title is her talk is entitled The State of the Nation, What We Know About Learning Biology. Um, the Karski Award honors an educator for outstanding teaching of microbiology to undergraduate students and for encouraging them to subsequent achievement. Loretta holds a PhD from St. John's University and is professor and chair of the Department of Biological Sciences at Kingsborough Community College in Brooklyn, New York, where she has been teaching since 1994. In addition to her teaching of nursing and allied health students, as well as science majors, she also continues to research antibiotic production by marine microorganisms, as well as seeking funding for many educational outreach programs, including NSF funding recently. She has been an active leader in science education and a longtime ASM collaborator. She currently serves on the ASM Education Board as the liaison to the ASM Science Teaching Fellows and Biology Scholars Program. Loretta was in the first cohort of the ASM Biology Scholars Program and has recently run the ASM Biology Scholars Program Research Residency. She is also the research section editor for ASM's Jimby, and she has also volunteered her time in developing the AAAS Vision and Change Policy Statement. Just to reflect upon Loretta's nomination, uh, I would just like to read this quote from one nominator who noted that Loretta truly embodies the criteria for this award. Not only does she support biology undergraduate education at the national level, but she practices what she preaches at her home institution with distinction. And with that said, Loretta, I welcome you up and it is truly an honor to have you speak to us today. Thank you, Jen, and it's wonderful to be introduced by a fellow community college person. And there it goes. Okay, so for the past 22 years, I've been teaching at Kingsborough Community College, so those are the buildings that you see in the background. And in the foreground, those are our students collecting horseshoe crabs at a local beach by campus. So where are we with regards to STEM education in the United States? So a analysis of 15 year olds out of 34 countries throughout the world ranked us 27 in math and 20th in science. And about 25 years ago, we were leading the pack in this. So we can definitely do better than that. So what are the issues? So some of them are, have to do with our STEM students. Who are they and where are they? Spending with regards to STEM education and training and the STEM pipeline debate. So let's take a minute to look at degrees awarded um, to STEM graduates. So as you can see, according to race and ethnicity, Whites are far outseeding any of the minority groups combined, um, with blacks at 6%, Hispanics at 7%, um, Indians 1%, and our Asian Pacific Islanders 12%. So the actual degrees awarded. Over a 20-year period, again, uh, whites are leading the pack on this. And at the bottom of the graph are our underrepresented students. So let's take a closer look at that part of the graph. Asian Pacific Islanders increase in earning STEM degrees over time. So now we'll get to the part that's not as pleasant. Um, our black students, somewhat of an increase and now a little bit on a decline. Hispanic students, an increase, but the expectation is that's going to level off. And the bottom is our uh, Native American and Alaska Natives, where they're, they are, seem to be at a steady state. So where are those students that fulfill those categories? Uh, they're at community colleges. So if we want science to represent those groups, 
blacks, Hispanics. We need to invest in community colleges. And if you look at the last four bars on that graph, community colleges are the location to find those students. Okay, so now a little bit about spending, spending and we'll try and pull these things together. So federal government spends $3.4 billion and the Department of, Aid, of Labor adds another $862 million for a grand total of $4.3 billion. Of that spending, 45% of the funding is for bachelor's degree or higher STEM education. 22% for training and sub-bachelor's education. So maybe if our funding is re-examined, we can invest in community colleges and build our STEM pipeline, which we'll talk about next. So every time I talk about STEM pipeline, I get into trouble. And there's always this issue, it's leaking, it's not leaking. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So the answer is, it's leaking and it is not leaking. So let's go through some of these. So jobs in academia. With regards to PhDs, we have more PhDs than jobs in academia here in the United States. Government and government-related job sector. There is some employment there for PhD students, PhDs. Um, the issue becomes that a lot of the PhDs that we award go to international students and they don't qualify for these jobs. So there's some openings there. Private sector, it depends on the specific STEM discipline. So for those students that are interested in software development, in chemical engineering, in cybersecurity, there are jobs. However, that brings us to the next, location, location, location. Um, there are jobs, some states in the United States. So if you're interested in software, please by all means go to California. If you're interested in engineering and the petroleum industry, Texas is a place where there's jobs. Biotech, there's some jobs right here in Massachusetts and in California, but those numbers are dwindling as we move more of that work offshore. Whether there's a leaky STEM pipeline or not, the fact of the matter is our students are leaving STEM. And in the case of community colleges, some of them leave and they never earn a college degree. And the reason they leave, they think their introductory courses are weed out courses. Their courses don't seem relevant. And the learning atmosphere is uninviting and uninspiring. Whether it's a STEM student or not, all students benefit from studying STEM because as you go through that process, you learn about asking questions, solving problems, developing your analytical skills, developing ideas, and learning to work in teams, which are skills that you can use anywhere. So if that isn't enough to make people rethink STEM education, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology in 2012 published the Engage to Excel report, um, and they talk about producing one million additional STEM graduates. Interesting, but I kind of like this second part. Catalyze widespread adoption of empirically validated, validated teaching practices, including the establishment of discipline-focused programs funded by discipline societies to train current and future faculty in evidence-based teaching practices. So what's been the response to that 2012 report? So I'm gonna go over with you something about some learning activities, redesigning our classrooms, and gathering evidence about effective teaching practices. So first, our learning activities. We've taught naked and given students the opportunity to go through basic information at their homes and come to class and work on those higher order thinking skills. We've taught with our mouths shut, giving students the opportunity to ask questions and be involved in their learning. And as an instructor, you're more of a cognitive coach than one who professes. Our STEM classrooms. 
So traditionally, there was someone talking and a whole bunch of people listening. Um, large classrooms, pretty good. We get a lot of students exposed to STEM and being involved in STEM classes. The issue becomes, though, what if I have a question? Am I going to be able to ask my question? And am I going to be able to answer it in that environment? So we've cre created rooms that look a little different. So here are some students working in an active learning room. So it says something to a student when they walk into a room and they see round tables and computers rather than rows of chairs where they're going to sit and someone is in the front of the room. And through those active learning classrooms, students are creating materials, working with one another, and coming up with their own ideas. Okay, next, some evidence about the effectiveness of um, what we've been doing in STEM learning. Uh, so in 2014, Scott Freeman and his group uh, published in the proceedings in the National Academy of Science, active learning increases student performance in science, engineering, and mathematics. You'll hear more about this later, uh, but in brief, for those classes that participated in active learning, there was a 6% increase in exam scores compared to those that had a traditional lecture format. And they also found that those students participating in lecture format were 1.5 times more likely to fail than those students that participated in active learning. So that's one study. Uh, we need to continue on this route about gathering data. So in order to do that, we need to develop some better tools and expertise among faculty so they can develop tools and ask questions about student learning. So let's talk about tools, concept inventories. You'll hear a little bit about these later on. So the first, con one of the earlier concept inventory was in physics. It's the force concept inventory, examining uh, student knowledge of Newtonian physics. For biology, uh, there's the genetics concept inventory and the introductory molecular and cell biology concept inventories. And there are benefits to using concept inventory. And all of these are about 25 to 30 multiple choice questions. And the benefits are they're validated. So better than the test that I would create. Um, the choices for these multiple choice questions are based on research, on student misconceptions. And hopefully, using these concept inventories nationally uh, will inform teaching practice and the direction of STEM education. So invent inventories and ways to assess student learning, that's one aspect. Next, something about our faculty. And we need to work with faculty uh, to provide them with the skill set to conduct studies on teaching and learning and our professional societies will be, play a key role in that. And also, the findings of those studies need to be shared, and two possible ways they can be shared is through conference presentations and peer-reviewed publications. So I'd like to tell you about some of the activities I've been involved in, and most of them have been with ASM. So the first one is the Science Teaching Fellows Program. Um, so it's a training program for graduate students and postdocs and early career PhDs. It's a series of webinars and also the uh, participants carry out a pre-assignment and a post-assignment. Uh, the webinars have been on course design, assessment, active learning techniques, and writing a teaching philosophy statement. There have been three cohorts so far. Um, and the analysis of the most recent cohort, they reported that they're rethinking the way they conducted their class and 85% of them said they need to rewrite their teaching philosophy statement as a result of their experience. Another program, the Biology Scholars Program. So as Jen told you, I was a biology scholar in 2005, before it was called Biology Scholars. Um, one of those transformative educational experiences for me and has led me to be involved in this program today. Um, three different areas for biology scholars. Assessment, 
which has had about 80 participants, research, which has had about 180 participants, and writing and publishing, which has had about 23 participants. And in the next few slides, we'll show you where these people that have participated had ended up. So one way they can present, present your work and everyone can be involved is through ASMQ, our conference for undergraduate educators. So in that photograph is Emily Fisher and Katie Tiff of Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and they presented their work as a result of their participation in biology scholars in the 2012 ASMQ. Other venues for peer-reviewed publication, the Journal of Microbiology and Biology Education, and CBE Life Sciences Education. So let's look at a few of those. So another biology scholar, Amy Saigismund, she recently published a paper on increasing student metacognition and learning through classroom-based learning communities and self-assessment. And in Amy's paper, she's had students write reflective statements about what they think about their learning. She had them predict their grades um, and then look at the actual grade that they got. Always predicted a higher grade than they actually got. Um, but then part of it was going through a survey to think about how come I thought I got an A on that exam, but I didn't. I ended up with a C. The next paper, so it's a kind of a qualitative approach. Next paper, early engagement in course-based research graduation increases graduation rates and completion of science, engineering, and mathematics degrees. This is a paper in CBE Life Sciences Education. So going through all these papers, I picked this one because this one actually reports that students that participated in um, a three-semester research-based experience in the classroom ended up with higher grad six-year graduation rates and higher GPAs than those that did not. So here we're getting at, we're doing these innovative techniques and now we're showing how effective they are. So next, let's move from individuals to department level change. Um, I've been the opportunity to be involved in the Partnership for Undergraduate Life Science Education. Uh, this started in 2012 as a collaboration between National Science Foundation, uh, National Institute of Health, and Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, in 2012, it's consisted of 40 chairs or deans. The interesting thing about Pulse is there's representation among the fellows from all types of institutions. So community colleges have representation, as do research institutions, regional comprehensive institutions, and liberal arts institutions. One of the products of the work of Pulse has been the vision and change rubrics. The rubrics were created in order to have departments determine how well are they meeting the recommendations in the vision and uh, change report? So the rubrics consist of six separate rubrics. One's on curriculum alignment, assessment, faculty practice and support, infrastructure, and climate for change. Each 67 criteria total Departments score themselves on zero to four, four a zero being baseline and four being exemplary. And people have reported that mm, it's hard to use the rubrics. I have no idea what any of these terms mean. Uh, so with that, there's an instruction manual which explains each criterion listed and the kinds of things that they represent. For those folks that aren't ready to do 67 criteria, there is a short version of the rubrics, and it's called the snapshot rubric. And it consists of 17 elements, all those larger rubrics. So coming 
soon in CBE Life Sciences Education, um, publication about um, the rubrics and the initial data that we have gathered. So the paper is entitled The Pulse Vision and Change Rubrics 1.0, a valid and equitable tool to measure life sciences department transformation at all institution types. So I'll give you a little preview, but I don't want to tell you everything that's in that paper. So for those institutions, 26 institutions submitted data, submitted data through the rubric portal. Um, and to be included in this particular part of the study, you have to have completed all six rubrics. Um, on the graph, they're showing you the different institution types, research in red, regional comprehensive in blue, liberal arts in green, and in purple community colleges. Total score, weighted score, is 596. Okay, so if you have a four in everything and then go through the weighting screen, total score 196. And on this graph, the thing that we were trying to bring out is the rubrics are equitable. What you'll notice here is that there isn't th these, that community colleges are doing better than all the other institutions. There are higher scores within a particular institution uh, type and lower scores. So with that and some other statistical analysis we did, we concluded the rubrics are valid and equitable. No bias. Some other key findings. Um, the highest scores were on curriculum alignment. So curriculum alignment, um, pretty straightforward. We all think our students should know something about genetics and evolution, so not much debate there. So most people were able to change their curriculum so that it reflects vision and change and those key ideas that are there. The lowest scores in assessment. Okay, so we know what we should teach, we just don't know if our students are learning it. Um, looking at different institution types, liberal arts colleges scored statistically higher on the faculty practice and support rubric than any other institution, so that faculty and support rubric has to do with um, what type of um, activities do you offer students? What support do you have for faculty? So thinking about what's done at liberal arts colleges, small class size, interaction between faculty and students, that kind of makes sense. Last point, for these rubrics, curriculum alignment is the only one specific for STEM. So these rubrics can, I'm sorry, specific for biology. So these rubrics can be used by other departments. So we'd like you to be part of the national data set. So if you and your department colleagues would like to submit your data, um, you could go to the rubric portal, and now you're actually working on um, the rubrics 2.0, since we closed out the 1.0 version. There are two portals, one for the full rubrics and one for the snapshot, and there's the link at pulsecommunity.org. Okay, so this is bringing us to the idea of some big data, um, not only in genomics, but in some uh, education research. Last thing about departmental change. Um, this recent paper in CBE Life Sciences, Colleagues as Change Agents, How Department Networks and Opinion Leaders Influence Teaching at a Single Research University. A beautiful paper. Um, while STEM, the STEM department rubrics and the uh, Pulse rubrics are looking at um, quantitative data, this was more of a qualitative approach, and it looked at how do faculty interact with one another, and what materials do they share with one another. Okay. Uh, interviews were done of these faculty, so it gives people the impression of uh, what can I do in my department if I can't actually get numbers. So the mix of quantitative and qualitative will really help in the idea of what's going on with STEM education here in the United States. So some concluding remarks. Um, students should be experiencing the excitement of being a scientist in classrooms. 
No doubt, everyone here, as a scientist, you love what you do, and our students should also feel that same way about science. We need reliable tools. So Rachel Horak is going to tell us about the development of some reliable tools for student learning. Uh, faculty need to develop a skill set to do this. So faculty experiencing professional development activities are more, more likely to interact with their colleagues and enact change. Last, in the age of big data, um, it needs to be applied to research on teaching and learning. So you'll hear a little bit more about this when Michelle Smith talks about the meta-analysis of active learning papers. Um, and also, that's part of um, using uh, concept inventories and rubrics. Numbers don't always tell the story. So this combination of doing research that is quantitative and also qualitative uh, will move this idea of what's going on with our students and STEM education. Also, we need to meet our students where they are. So whatever their skills are, we start there and build on that. So with that, it's important to think about where our students are and what they're doing. Because in the end, my students and your students, they're going to solve the problems of global warming. They're going to solve the problems of our need for alternative energy. They're going to solve the problems about uh, global health equity and eradication of disease. So last, some people I'd like to thank. Um, first, my Kingsborough Community College students. I have definitely learned more from them than they have learned from me about microbiology. I've learned about what it's like to be the first in your family to go to college. I've learned about what it's like to come to college, but you can't take any college level courses because the education system has failed you and you don't have the math and English skills to take college level courses. I've learned about what it's like not to have enough money to buy the textbook for the course or not to have $2.75 to come to campus and sit in my classroom. Despite all of that, they still get a college degree and move on. Some other people I'd like to thank our ASM faculty programs people and the education division people, Amy Chang, Kelly Gold, Kerry Wester, Claudia Ratty, Michelle Sloan, Irene Hulliday. If I didn't meet these women, I would have a lot of free time on my hands. <laughs> However, I wouldn't be the educator that I am today. I'd like to thank Theodore Karski and Marcy Kelly. If without them, I wouldn't be standing in front of you today. My colleagues at Kingsborough, Mary Ortiz and Janine Graziano, they work with me every single day on improving the educational experience we give to our students. And my Pulse colleagues, Marcy Kelly, Pam Pape Lindstrom, and Akif Usman, um, who worked on those recognition uh, and uh, Pulse rubrics with me, and the paper. Finally, my family. Um, my mother and father and my in-laws. My mother taught first grade. She would be so proud to see me here in front of you today. Um, and was a reading specialist. Um, my brothers and sisters, and last, my husband. Um, seeing me through all of this, okay, as you can imagine, busy lady who um, likes to do what she wants to do, not always the easiest person in the world to live with. Um, so I thank you, okay. So in closing, we have a couple of minutes while we're transitioning to our next speaker. If anybody does have any questions for, for Loretta, if uh, she'd be willing to address them while we're changing over. And I believe the microphone is live over there.
just got to got take a moment. Here we go. And I believe no once she went through, then it's okay. done. There you go. So what you just want to do mm -hmm. is move the arrow off yes, the side right. of the bed. All right. Thank you so much for uh, being here today. My name's Kimberly Tanner, and I am a professor of biology at San Francisco State University. I am not used to being up behind a podium, so I'm kind of a hard time not going out there. Um, uh, important things to know about me, I'm a neurobiologist by training, so it's exciting to be at Microbe 2016. It's not a conference I would usually be attending. Uh, I'm first generation college going, and that influences an awful lot of how I think about education. Uh, and I never actually planned on being a professor, so it's a kind of a, a strange path that I have pursued over the years. Uh, when I was asked to participate, I, I uh, of course accepted the gracious invitation, and long ago I chose this titer, title, Promoting Diversity and Equity in Biology Education, because it's a topic that I don't think gets nearly enough attention in a lot of education symposiums, so it was sort of a placeholder. Um, and then, uh, when I was deciding what to talk about, I decided to bring some uh, relatively new research from my lab around instructor talk and efforts to measure the unmeasurable. Uh, and I did that because I looked at the symposium outcomes, which I want to say are incredibly ambitious. <laughs> uh, and so I'm going to try in the course of my time with you to share a little bit about resources that will come more towards the end, share a little bit about a uh, something to think about in teaching that maybe is novel to you. Uh, and I'm going to share a story of how we went about collecting data on something uh, like everybody does in science, where we made an observation and then we tried to go out and get systematic about it. So uh, my laboratory does lots of different kinds of research. It's called the Science Education Partnership and Assessment Laboratory. It's sort of at the intersection of biology education and cognitive psychology and social science. Uh, and since I'm only going to talk about one piece of our work, I want to give you a bit of a broad context. So in our lab, the things that drive what we do research on relate to some key ideas. The first of which being that in the U.S., about twice as many undergrads appear to leave the sciences as the humanities. Loretta already sort of alluded to this, and on the right is a wonderful study that's now over a decade old called Talking About Leaving that's being redone in the U.S. right now. But it was one of the first pieces of evidence that showed us that we had really talented people leaving the sciences, that there are no statistically significant differences between the people who leave and the people who stay in terms of GPA or achievement. Um, and they're talented people who are leaving because they do not feel comfortable in our learning environments. That relates very directly to the fact that women and scientists of color continue to be underrepresented in the sciences. Uh, and I like to um, say that every scientist I've ever met loves their discipline. And if you love your discipline, you have to care about issues of equity and diversity. Organizational psychology has shown for decades that those teams that are most diverse solve complex problems in the most creative ways. So, um, so it's not just about being nice or being friendly, it's about loving your discipline and getting to solutions. Um, the other thing that drives an awful lot of what we do is that few scientists have formal training and effective teaching. So raise your hand if you were formally trained how to teach the science that you do right now in, in your life. So there are a few people, look around, look around. There are a few people that have experienced that. Um, most of us have not. I'm known around the country for being a huge advocate for faculty. It is deeply unfair in this country that we train people to be outstanding researchers and then many of those people get dropped into classrooms in uh, colleges and universities with no training in how to effectively teach what they know to others. And it's this third point that actually launches uh, this, the study that I want to briefly introduce you to today which is that work that I'm not particularly known for, uh, is we do a lot of faculty professional development at San Francisco State University. I work with about 25% of the biology faculty in community colleges in the Bay Area. Uh, we work a lot with our own faculty. And on the right is kind of a graphic representing what's called scientific teaching, sort of big tenets of uh, innovative teaching, active learning, assessment, equity and diversity, all of it undergirded by collecting some sort of classroom evidence. And it was in the process of doing faculty development that we stumbled on an observation that's actually opened up a whole new line of inquiry in my lab, much like uh, my observations as a neurobiologist opened up new lines of inquiry when I was a younger scientist. And that observation is this. We have lots of faculty who go through professional development with us and they're pretty enthusiastic and they go out and they implement lots of active learning strategies. We have lots of ways to measure that. And what we see is really highly variable success with students and that's in multiple measures. So that could be in terms of changing students' minds and getting shifts on assessments, but also in terms of just having students be willing to engage with them in sort of new approaches to teaching. And one of the observations that was made by several graduate students who were working uh, in our projects at the time was that these faculty seemed to be saying different things. So you can have faculty all go out, 
be spending the same amount of time doing pair discussions or some sort of interactive learning in a classroom, but you can get really different outcomes. So we wanted to understand a little bit more about that, and this observation seemed like a place to start. So what might mediate variable faculty success with active learning in a classroom? What more specifically is happening in undergraduate biology classrooms? And that's actually an area of active research in lots and lots of laboratories right now, biology education, physics education. Um, there are people, this is some, some work from uh, many years ago, a decade ago, from uh, geoscience educators where you ask students and faculty what's happening in classrooms directly. Our dear colleagues at Michigan have published papers, what we say is not what we do, or you have to be skeptical of that self-report data. Um, and you'll get to hear hopefully later from Michelle Smith, maybe on this, maybe on something else, about protocols to actually go in and try and systematically describe what's happening. All these are wonderful tools, and there are many more that I'm not even going to list, but none of them quite get to the fine grain size level of well, what are faculty actually saying during class time, and what are they saying that might influence these kinds of things? Science identity. What do you say in a classroom that might cause students to see themselves in your discipline or see themselves as not in your discipline? Uh, a sense of belonging, a sense of self-efficacy or their feeling that they can accomplish things and do it, or enthusiasm for active learning. So we set out to try and study this. Um, and what I want to do really briefly, which is why I hope you're sitting near Buddy, and if you need to get up, I encourage you to get up. It's good to stretch at this point, is to go find a, a person nearby, share your name and your institution, and then I want you to think of a biology course either that you recently taught, that's fine, or you can think of one from being a student. And what do you remember either yourself as an instructor or an instructor you had saying in class that was not related to content? And I'm just going to say take, take like 10 seconds to think for 10 seconds. Just think, just think. All right, see, you guys can't even think, can't wait for 10 seconds. Okay, turn and talk to a buddy. It should get incredibly loud in here. Just for one minute, share your name, your institution, and one thing you remember. All right, I'm going to interrupt. I'd be curious if there are a couple people, uh, and you're going to get a chance to talk a little bit more. So if your second person needs to share more about it, I know sometimes it's a march down memory lane and it can take a little bit longer than the time I have. If, if I could have just two hands of people who are willing to share one thing that you remember either saying yourself or hearing an instructor say, that would help me immensely. I just want two hands. And I see one hand back there in kind of a black sweater, and I see one hand up here in a pink shirt. I'm sorry, I'm so far away from you, I would normally run to you. Uh, so the, in my class, the person who raises their hand last gets to go first. So hang loose for a second. Uh, really loud, what do you remember? Giving analogies. Giving, could you give an example? Uh, if I'm talking about organisms bumping into each other, I'll give a reference, a family reference of my twins bumping into each other. Aha. Uh -huh. So she's talking about in the context of her teaching, maybe she might use an analogy, and maybe that analogy might relate to her twins bumping into each other, a family reference. Thank you. That's really helpful. And thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Talking about your pets a lot. There you go. And actually, we have that in our data set. So <laughs> pets, pets and children come up a lot. So there are all sorts of different things different people remember. I, when we were starting on this project, one of the things that struck me was uh, uh, a colleague of mine, and I said, what do you really remember from, she was a chemist, undergraduate chemistry, and she said, I remember the instructor telling us that he was going to try and learn every single one of our names, and he was probably going to fail, but damn it, he was going to try. <laughs> and, um, and that actually was pretty influential in this project as well. 
All right, so um, I want to just give you a brief insight into the literature, going back to learning outcome one, which is that there's a lot of evidence from other research literatures about why we should be paying attention, measuring, and analyzing what faculty are saying in classrooms. The first is from the field of communication studies, and this is something I was completely unaware of before a few years ago. There's a concept called instructor immediacy, uh, and it's sort of a measure of the social distance between a student and an instructor. And there's some evidence, although frankly, I'm looking forward to many, many more studies that try and correlate uh, instructor immediacy and social distance with learning. So there's some uh, indications, both pre-college and higher ed, that the closer the social distance between a student and instructor, the higher the learning gains. Um, the second literature that's relevant, which is uh, summarized in a, a review article that Shannon Seidel, who's a postdoc in my lab, was lead author on, is that there's a lot of evidence that students will resist active learning. Um, and sometimes student resistance to active learning is sort of uh, pointed to as being, oh, students don't want to work hard in a classroom, they don't want to do something, sort of a student deficit model. But in fact, a lot of the research literature would point to the fact that it's faculty behaviors or faculty language that's sort of sparking off somehow that student resistance. And the last one, and the one that I think is most, uh, got the most research behind it and most literature behind it is a phenomenon called stereotype threat. Uh, and stereotype threat was uh, discovered by uh, Claude Steele, whose picture is down there at the right, and colleagues in his laboratory. is a fabulous book called Whistling Vivaldi. It's a popular book if you want to dive into it. And uh, it's a complex literature, but one aspect of it is that instructors can say things in, 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 in situations, people can say things in situations, that cause someone that you know performs in the top 10%, 10 for example, you can plummet their, their scores on an assessment in half. So just by language that's said, sometimes less than 15 words, sometimes it doesn't even have to be language, you can severely impede the performance uh, of a student on an assessment. As a neurobiologist, this links up to a lot of what we know about synaptic transmission and stress. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in the literature, but I want you to have in your mind, like we're not, uh, there's lots of other literatures that would suggest studying what's being said in classrooms is gonna be really important. So, We've termed this language that's not content, but maybe about kids or dogs or lots of other things, instructor talk. Uh, and that's, so you'll hear me say instructor talk a lot. It's obviously said by instructors. It's said during class time, so we're not studying a lot of language that happens like in office hours or in the hallways. It's all class time. It excludes course content. So we actually take transcripts of classrooms and we delete everything that has to do with content. So the analogy, for example, that's got the biology part uh, that our colleague shared would probably get deleted from this, but then the kids bouncing around uh, would be kept in and coded as instructor talk. It excludes agenda items like, you know, we're gonna start at 9.12 and some simple stuff like that. Um, and if you wanna really dig into it, uh, Shannon Seidel, once again, as the lead author on the paper, she's now an assistant professor of microbiology at Pacific Lutheran University. Uh, she published a paper last year in CBE called Beyond the Biology, a Systematic Investigation of Non-Content -Con Instructor Talk in an Introductory Biology Class. And I want to just tell you a little bit about that study and then some hot off the press data and then hopefully leave some time for questions. So the initial research questions that came out of that observation that, well, some faculty go out and do active learning and, and uh, seem to be doing, having a lot of success and others don't, was uh, to try and go and look and say, hey, to what extent is instructor talk present in a single biology course? And the initial motivation was to say, let's go look in a course where uh, things are really successful and there's a high pass rate and students are not resisting because maybe we could build a bank of language that we could offer our colleagues who are struggling. It really started out as trying to help our colleagues who are struggling and in implementing innovative teaching. Um, so we wanted to know, well, is it present and how much? And if it's there, question two, what kind of different types or flavors or categories is there? And if there are different categories, which one is most prevalent and is it what we would predict? And then finally, to what extent, if we did find it in a single course, would we see it in a much larger number of courses? So um, the methods were we used videotape of a, an intro bio course that had been recorded before this idea ever came about. So there happened to be two instructors in that course. They had no prior knowledge of the study. Um, and they reported little to no student resistance and high levels of student success and satisfaction. And really importantly, they included a lot of varied active learning strategies and equity and diversity strategies. So we just did kind of a brief think, pair, share, clickers, group work, minute papers, jigsaws, and culturally relevant case studies. So we thought, ah, this is maybe a class where we could build a bank of language that could be helpful to our colleagues, and we could see, well, how much of this really is there? And we were really surprised. Um, I was very surprised, because when we actually measured the extent to which it was present, we found 650 instances of instructor talk 
uh, in 29 hour-long class sessions. So the recordings, we didn't have kind of the whole course, but 650 instances. And an instance can be like a sentence, or an instance can be sort of a short sort of vignette. Uh, so we use instances kind of in the spirit of linguistics. Um, so 650 instances. So I want to give you a sense of what those instances were. So in qualitative research, what you do is you take all those examples and you sort them and you try and put them into categories. And I'm going to give you the categories and a brief sort of overview and then I'm going to give you five quotes and I want you with a buddy to try and code them because that will help us in sort of making some predictions and looking at the data. So uh, focus on the left hand of this slide. So, uh, we found, uh, we sort of came up with a, a framework, we call it, for instructor talk. And on the left, which is where I want you to orient yourself, are five big categories. All of those 650 quotes fit into these five categories. Um, those categories have nuances to them, which are the subcategories on the right. So some of them have three subcategories, some have five. Don't worry about that. That's why it's in gray. Um, but the big categories that we found, some had been predicted and some had not. So the, one, the first category up there, explaining pedagogical choices. It's very common for people in faculty development to assert that, that the faculty should go out and tell students, there's research, that's why I'm doing this, <laughs> right, and explain all that. There's not any evidence that that necessarily gets student buy-in, but it's commonly asserted. Uh, unmasking science, or a whole group of instructor talk quotes that shouldn't be surprising. We love science. I figured we would talk about sort of the process of science, uh, being explicit about what that means. There's even a subcategory there about promoting diversity in science. Who does science? The third category, which both of our shares I think would fit into, sharing your personal experience it, dogs, kids, what it was like when you were an undergrad, all sorts of things like that. Um, and then these last two are ones that were not as explicitly sort of predicted or asserted by other people commonly. The fourth one, building the instructor-student relationship. A lot of those quotes related to demonstrating respect for students or revealing secrets of success or trying to really boost their confidence and self-advocacy. And then the last one, establishing classroom culture, uh, was more about trying to build a biology community among the students. So relationships among the students, how are we going to work together um, in this classroom? So on this next slide, I've just re put those five categories, same order, A, explaining pedagogical choice, B, unmasking science, and so on, so they have letters. And what I want to do is, and, and I'm doing a lot of active learning in this piece, so we're only going to take a couple minutes. If you don't get through all of them, that's completely fine. But what I'd like you to do is with a buddy, and you can do it with a group of three, that's fine, is to work together and take turns reading each quote out loud, because this is language, right? So, and it's verbal, oral language. So reading things out loud sometimes helps you get some insight into it. And discuss which of those categories, you, I've just introduced them to you, you don't necessarily uh, know a lot about them, you think they might fit into and why. Uh, and then at the end, uh, I'm going to ask people to maybe share out what letter they think each quote goes with. So we're only going to take maybe a minute, get as far as you can. If you don't get through all of them, it's totally fine. But I want to give you a chance to sort of think about these categories in the context of some data. So there they are. I'm going to leave you to it for about a minute, read them out loud, and it should get very loud in here with people talking. All right, 
Okay, however far you got, I need to keep myself going. I'm going to read the quote and then um, a very explicit equity strategy in large classes I teach about a uh, 300 person introductory biology class is, uh, I don't do it always, but is choral response. Like if I ask my students how many carbon dioxides are produced for every glucose molecule that goes through cellular respiration, then they can shout a number at me and I can figure out really quickly whether or not they know what's going on. So, uh, so I'm just going to do that for a few of these. Uh, so the first one, I don't have a special email for you guys. You get the same email as my research colleagues and friends get. So anytime you want to email, you use that. So which letter would you think that goes with? And if we don't agree, it's totally fine. Shout it really loud, a letter. D. D, you're rock stars. Look at that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Second one, some of the most important people in this room for you to be successful in this course are sitting around you, okay? They're not up on stage. E. E. Okay. Um, so... I'm going to start this up and let you guys weigh in and see where you're at. And based on that, it will tell me where to go. A. A. Science is about making predictions. Science is not about memorizing things. B. 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 Some people love that quote. Some people hate that quote. Uh, that's where I used to sit. I would sit in the back and I would never say a word. C. 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 Yeah, sharing personal experience. So um, I don't want to give you the impression that qualitative coding is that straightforward, so there's a lot, a lot of work that went into coming up with those five categories and 17 subcategories. And there are plenty of quotes where, uh, where two, uh, multiple observers don't agree, but we get about 85% iterator reliability on the data that I'm going to show you. So, so what categories of instructor talk would you think might be most prevalent? So just taking a look at those, just make a mental note. In the spirit of time, I'm not going to have you talk to someone, but which might be most prevalent and which might be least prevalent. Uh, and then I'm going to show you the data. So in this first class that we analyzed, there was a lot of surprise. Most of the literature would say that explaining pedagogical choice should be the most prevalent, and yet that was only about one in five quotes. So it was about 20%. The most prevalent quotes by far in this particular class, right? So it was just the first class where we tried to describe it were equally building the instructor-student relationship and establishing class culture. And I want to go back to the beginning and the title of the talk. So this talk was about promoting equity and diversity in biology. There are tons of people who've studied that. There are so many strategies you can use. But I think in this particular course, this building the instructor-student relationship and establishing class culture uh, is potentially one mechanism, one mediation of why that class didn't have a lot of student resistance, had a lot of student learning, had a lot of student success. Um, it's sort of surprising in this class that sharing personal experience, which are our two examples, uh, was one of the lowest categories, and unmasking science is always seems very, very low um, for whatever set of reasons. So, so now we have a set of categories. We have a way to code them. We have a way to quantify them. Um, so to what extent is this relevant? Would we find evidence in instructor talk in, you know, if we looked at dozens and dozens of other biology courses? So uh, we did do that. We collaborate, collaborated with a lot of community college biology faculty, a lot of four-year university biology faculty. We have a data set of about 63 courses that were recorded not specifically with this in mind, so we were recording for other purposes. And turn and talk to a neighbor just for 15 seconds. Where do you put your money? What percent of those courses do you think we're going to find instructor talk? No, just talk to a buddy. 15 seconds, 15 seconds. Wherever you are, uh, let me show you kind of what about 60 faculty look like. So instructor talk was detected in 98% of the samples that we looked at. I'm going to tell you there's some bias to the sample in just a second. So 98% of them. And these were 63 biology instructors from multiple community colleges and a four-year university. And it's important to know that all of these people had been through what's called a scientific teaching institute. Okay, so they had committed to do a fair amount of faculty professional development. Now, they're the same group of people where we had seen highly variable sort of success, very hand-wavy, not measured success with implementation. Um, and we didn't look at whole courses. We looked at two 15-minute samples, and we took one sample from the first, first course that was recorded and one that was about mid-semester. I'm not showing you a lot of data that's in the paper, but we wanted to try and maximize the opportunity to see it. 
Um, this is what those faculty look like though. So the y-axis is the number of instructor talk instances for their sample, okay? So it's like 30 minutes, it's not a whole course. And the red bar is the Seidel et al. paper, the original course. So that paper in that same 30 minute sampling procedure had about 30 in instances of instructor talk. And what I want you to notice is it was definitely at the high end of all the faculty that we've looked at. It wasn't the highest, but it was the second highest. Um, and then there was just this incredibly wide range. So there was only one class with a 30 minute sample where everything was content <laughs> from the first day and the middle day. But there were tons of um, folks who were down in kind of this low range um, uh, down here. Uh, and so, so we have a, a measure that seems to get at something happening in classrooms we haven't looked at before. We have a lot of variability uh, within that measure. So it's now opportunity to look at all sorts of correlates. So I want to say one other thing before I sort of wrap up, and that was that the other thing that we noticed in looking at 63 courses was that we came up with about 10% of instances across those faculty that we could not categorize in the original instructor talk framework. And we've ended up c calling these unproductive instructor talk instances for lack of a better term. I'm not particularly thrilled with that term. And I'll just read you a few of them. So you don't need to sneak in. You're right on time today for a change. <laughs> Ouch. Every time I read that, it's just painful for me. Uh, I'm sure that that faculty member didn't intend to quite say that, but things happen. I mean, I'm sure I've said things that are not necessarily going to fit into one of those more positive categories. And so when you're plotting something that's 0 0.5 and you put it here, I don't think you know what the hell you're doing, okay? And so a lot of people lost points last time because they were plotting things you know casually. Now granted, I'm putting intonation in this, and who knows what the in intonation um, is in the original recordings. I don't know who any of these faculty are. This, I'm blinded to all of this. Only, only postdocs uh, know who these people are. And then the last one, some people find that if you haven't had a basic biology class before coming in here, it's a little harder. You've got to learn some of those basic concepts a little faster than other folks. And I include that one because that doesn't sound so bad, right? You can just be like, well, that's just giving people a heads up. But in terms of promoting equity and diversity, it can send, I, I predict that it can send a message to a student that, well, if you already feel like you're behind, it's your own problem to catch up. And it's not really part of my job to help you do that. So I think there is some language like that last one that might feel a little more innocuous, but uh, in fact might have problems. So I want to wrap up and just say that now we're going forward and trying to test hypotheses about what categories or total amount of instructor talk might predict or correlate with, and we're developing other measurement tools. Building instructor-student relationship and sharing personal experiences may have some relationship to instructor immediacy. Establishing class culture, explaining pedagogical choices we hypothesize might relate to minimizing uh, or unfortunately maximizing student resistance. Uh, and building instructor-student relationship and class culture and especially unmasking science and who does science might relate to stereotype threat. So if you want to read more about uh, Issues of equity and diversity, what can I take away now, Kimberly? Uh, there are plenty of CBE features that I've written around how you can practically promote equity and diversity in classrooms. Uh, and the last thing I'll leave you with is, when's the last time that you listened to a recording of yourself teaching? It's actually not hard to do. We all have cell phones. It's easy to record. Listen back. What do you notice? What non-content things do you say and why? And how could we all be more purposeful in thinking about what we do and we don't say to our students in classrooms that's around the content? And I really appreciate you spending your time with me today. This is work primarily by Shannon Seidel, Assistant Professor at Pacific Lutheran, and that wonderful picture of Colin Harrison, which he chose, who's a postdoc in my lab. Thank you so much for your time. We have a minute or two for questions. Hi, I'm Laura Runyon Janicki. I'm from the University of Richmond. And I was actually surprised that the personal category wasn't higher up there. And I don't know if you can identify this or not, but I'm curious about the question of faculty who can give their students, um, like I'm a first generation college student, saying something like that, I would predict that would have impact on classes where there is a large number of first generation college students. So were your instructors in a classroom where that might have mattered? Mm. Yeah, I think that it absolutely does matter. I think some of what uh, we are struggling with in this analysis is sometimes you can say things like that and once is the only time you need to say it maybe, right? Um, 
Or there are some characteristics that, like I have a colleague and she's very out. She's like, oh, Kimberly and I were both from Tennessee and we're both white, but I'm the gay one and she's the straight one. Like she's very out with our students um, uh, as a lesbian scientist. So I think uh, how much the quantity of instructor talk matters versus kind of what's actually said is something we're really struggling with. You could probably say, well, we know from stereotype threat, you just need to say 15 words that are deeply discouraging and, oh, see uh, and, and you can plummet somebody's score. So how to, how to deal with the quantity versus quality is something we're really struggling with. I will say in the larger data set, uh, sharing personal experience is much more prevalent across those 63 instructors. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Michelle Smith uh, from the University of Maine, and I'm going to go next. Um, but I thought while we were waiting for it to say that there's no presentation up there, I would tell a little story about how happy I am to be here. Um, I no longer work in microbiology, but in fact, ASM was the first uh, professional meeting I ever attended. I was a senior and undergraduate, and my advisor loaded us all into the family minivan and drove from Indiana to Atlanta. And I can distinctly remember being at my very first poster session, and I couldn't believe that actual scientists wanted to hear what I did as part of my senior project. So ASM has a very important uh, place in my heart, so thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm going to compliment what's already been brought up today, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the student learning side and using evidence from student learning to guide effective teaching and, and student experience. And I'm going to especially prov provide evidence about the importance of active learning on the student experience, and I'm going to contrast it with traditional lecturing, which is an instructional approach that's been a around for a long time. So in fact, lecturing has been the commonly acceptable mode of instruction since the origin of universities. And by way of illustration, I have this 14th century illustration of Henry of Germany delivering a lecture to university students. And as one of my friends, Scott Freeman, likes to point out in this painting, there's a lot of features that in fact you might recognize from your class today. And that there are some students in the back checking in with each other about how things are going. We have some catching up on much needed rest in the class. Uh, no texting at that time, but there are some students writing some notes to others. And then you have a bunch of pre-meds in the front row uh, <laughs> hanging on your every word. So, um, so of course, as it already has been brought up, uh, this report and in many different contexts, you can tell um, a lot of us really support and uh, use similar inspiration for our work. Um, that in fact we have a high dropout rate in STEM, so just another way of presenting this, that 46% of first year students who declare a STEM major at the beginning graduate with a STEM degree six years later for four year institutions. Half of the students who leave STEM leave between the first and second years, and students often identify ineffective instructional practices such as lecturing um, straight from the textbook as a reason for leaving. And of course, the report uh, to the president, the Engage to Excel report, is calling for 1 million more STEM graduates coming up. And part of the way of helping out with this um, issue is to improve the retention rates at um, various institutions of higher learning. So throughout the nation, and I imagine throughout this room, people are answering the call to action by incorporating active learning into their classroom. And of course, as we've seen, this can take a number of different um, ways in your classroom. So we're going to talk a little bit about clickers and clicker questions today. Um, people are introducing discussion questions and worksheet activities as a way to move beyond traditional lecturing. But of course, as we're starting to put these things in our classroom, the question is, what kind of effect is it having on student learning? And so much of the first generation, what I'm going to call first generation research in this area, was um, studies where people were contrasting traditional lecturing to some sort of active learning strategy, such as clicker questions. And the way these studies were typically done is that somebody would teach two sections of a course. One section would have this traditional lecture, traditional delivery at the front, and the other would involve some sort of active learning strategy. And then they would look at common assessments, um, they would look at the performance on that, or failure rates. And then they would take measurements to see if the active learning situation improves student learning over the traditional lecture. So these studies were really important to gather evidence about using active learning. But what we noticed was that the field wasn't progressing much beyond this. When people were doing studies, they were contrasting these two outcomes. 
And so what a group of us led by Scott Freeman at the University of Washington wanted to do was ask, is this first generation of research on undergraduate STEM education over? Can we say that active learning works in contrast to the traditional lecture? And then can we move beyond that and start to really investigate what about, what features, what talk elements really make a difference um, in the student experience? So I'm gonna go through some of the evidence that we collected about this today. And the way we did it is we did a meta-analysis. Um, and so we are looking for five criteria for admission to this meta-analysis. Uh, the first is that um, these articles needed to contrast any active learning intervention with traditional lecturing. We allowed the authors of the studies to um, identify what active learning is. Um, now people are going beyond that and looking more specifically about the quality and the dosage, but at this first pass, we were just looking at any active learning intervention. And again, it could be things like cooperative group activities in class, worksheets, clickers, and so forth and so on. Um, it had to be in an, a regularly scheduled course for undergraduates. Um, the changes needed to be limited to the conduct of a class section or recitation or discussion. Of course, at the same time, there are wonderful things that have been presented at this meeting about revisions that are happening to lab and independent work in the lab. Those are really important studies, just not part of the study that we did here. Um, it needed to involve a STEM course, and we used the NSF definition of what is STEM, and so those different um, disciplines are listed here. And then finally, the papers needed to include data on some aspect of academic performance. So give us exam score results, um, concept inventories, which you're gonna hear a little bit more about in the next talk, but um, just as a way of preview, these tend to be assessments that are designed by an out um, an outside research group where they spend a lot of time interviewing faculty and students about the meanings of questions. Um, so they can include those. These concept inventories are typically given on the first and last day of class. Or finally, data on failure rates. And uh, failure rate data are defined as D, F, and uh, W withdrawal rates. Okay, so where did we find all these articles for the meta-analysis? Well, we hand-searched every issue in 55 STEM education journals from 1998 to 2010. We queried seven online databases using 16 different terms. So for example, the term active learning was used. Uh, we mined 42 bibliographies and we looked at qualitative and quantitative reviews of the field to look to see what um, articles they cited. We did what we called snowballing, so we checked the citation lists of all publications in a study. And when we were all said and done, we had 642 papers. One researcher read through them and asked if they met the five criteria. At that point, we had 244 easy rejects, so they could be things like they were a laboratory study or a study done in a high school. Um, if they passed the initial uh, pass, then we had two coders go through them, confirm the five criteria, and then kick them out if the two uh, coders couldn't agree. And then once we had that set, we were looking for some features such as if they were reporting exam data, were they identical assessments? Um, you can imagine you could really game a study like this by, for example, asking a much easier exam in the active learning section compared to the traditional lecture. So it was important that people were using equivalent instruments. Um, equivalent students, of course, everybody in this room probably knows that no two groups of their students have ever been the same, but in fact, we are looking for some amount of measure, perhaps looking at SAT scores, GPAs, other things to say that roughly the student groups were equivalent, was the same in structure, teaching in both um, class periods, and did they include meta-analyzable data, such as failure rates, exam scores, et cetera. Uh, we did have uh, the missing data search, so we uh, contacted the authors of 91 papers um, and asked if we could have some additional data. Uh, oftentimes they would tell us things like, I don't even own the computer on which I did that study, so sorry, I don't have any more. But in fact, we got 19 additional studies in there um, by contacting the authors for extra information. And so when it was all said and done, we were looking at 225 studies from across the STEM disciplines. So I'm gonna start off and show you some evidence about the failure rates. So before I put up the data, although you can probably tell from the shape of this graph what's coming up next, I just thought I'd go through the axes. So the number of studies is on the y-axis, and the percent change in failure rate with active learning is on the x. So if you see something appear on the right, that indicates that there's a decreased failure rate in the active learning situation. And so you can see that the vast majority of the studies fall to the right. 
Um, so the average failure rate was 21.8% in the active learning classes versus 33.8% in the traditional lecturing courses. Um, because it's a meta-analysis, we could calculate, calculate a risk ratio of 1.5. So students in the traditional lecture courses are 1.5 times more likely to fail. So I know that this is not a biomedical randomized control trial. I know there are many people in this room that have experiences with that. But let's just imagine that it were. If it were, it would have been stopped because there was such an advantage to the students in the active learning classrooms. Um, I'll also say that there's a real financial argument for integrating active learning into the classes. So if we just look in our sample of papers that we used for this meta-analysis, 3,516 fewer students would have failed if they were in active learning classrooms. We then took the tuition rate for an in-state institution, it happened to be Washington State, and that's $3.5 million in saved tuition if we could have moved these students to active learning classrooms. So there's both an ethical argument and a financial one for moving towards more active learning. So that's the failure rate. Let's also look at exam uh, data across the disciplines. So here we have on the y-axis the STEM disciplines. Oh, every time I touch this it advances forward to me. Um, and then on the x-axis we have Hedges G, which is not a term that people are um, used to looking at when it comes to uh, learning data, but in fact it's a um, byproduct of the meta-analysis. So it's used to determine effect size. The units are in standard deviations and just by way of comparison in the K through 12 world, a um, uh, Hedges G value of 0.2 is a notable effect size. It's one that will sort of trigger policy decisions and changes at K through 12. So if we look across here, the numbers are the number of independent studies overall and for each of the STEM fields, and the lines are the 95% confidence intervals. So the take home message is that the overall effect size is 0.47. So students in active learning classes have higher grades. That translates to half a standard deviation, which again isn't a unit you're typically thinking about when you're thinking about grades, but that translates to roughly half a letter grade. So a student in a traditional lecturing class would have earned a B minus. If that were an active learning class, statistically they would earn a B, which can make real differences in their ability to continue on in the major and in programs beyond undergraduate. So the two take home messages are that students in active learning classes are one and a half more times likely to pass compared to students in traditional lecturing environments and that students in these active learning classes have higher grades, half a standard deviation, which is roughly half a letter grade. So we know this and we know about the advantages of doing this. The next question is what types of active learning can we incorporate into the classroom and what kind of difference is that making in the moment for student learning? So one of the instructional activities that's available to um, people teaching various biology classes is to use clickers. And for those of you who are not familiar, these are remote controlled devices. Often now phones can suffice as clickers. They have multiple choice answers. And what you can do is you can pose concept questions to your students and then have them vote on the answers throughout. It's great because the students get to practice um, the problem solving and learning in real time and the instructors are taking in real time information about what's going on in their classroom. So in the early days of using clickers, um, one of my jobs was to convince faculty colleagues to integrate them into their classrooms and give them a try. And this is the evidence I used to present to people. So I would say, well, the way clickers are advocated to be used is that you would ask, uh, put up a multiple choice question, you would ask students to answer the question individually, and then you would have the students talk to each other and answer the same clicker question again. And evidence from the physics literature, which is shown on the two graphs here, indicate that when students answer the question as individuals, you can have answers all over the place, but after they talk to each other, they generally converge on one answer, and most, but not all the time, that's the correct answer. And so I would say to faculty, look, this shows that students are actually learning from the discussion. So this worked well for most faculty until I met Tin Tin Su, who's a biologist at the University of Colorado, Boulder, and she said, well, this tells me nothing about whether or not they're learning, because couldn't students just copy their knowledgeable neighbor rather than learn anything themselves? So are they just looking for that smart person sitting around them and just copying what that person's doing? 
So I ran over to all the physics people who were the ones leading the clicker research and I asked them what evidence they had to help me address this question. And they didn't have an answer at that point. So I came back to Tintin and I said, this is a really great question. I have no answer. Shall we go ahead and investigate it in your classroom? And happily, she agreed. So this was, study was done in a genetics classroom of 350 students. So the way we did this study is we had students answer a clicker question individually. And I'm going to call this Q1 throughout the next few slides. And then we had students talk to their neighbors and answer Q1 again. And so I'm going to call it Q1 AD for question one after discussion. And so here we see on the graph, these are averages of questions throughout the entire semester, the percent correct, and you can see that after students talk to each other on average throughout the class, they do better. So we showed nothing different than what was seen from the physicists at this point. But what we did differently is that we then had students answer a different question individually, which I'm going to call Q2. And Q2 is asking about the same concept as Q1. And as I mentioned, this was done in a genetics course. So I'm going to show you a genetics problem, although you can imagine lots of different problems for the various biology topics people teach. So for example, and this is my artwork here, um, we would have students answer a question about fish and show them different um, outcomes from a cross, and this would be the Q1, Q1AD, so the one they would answer individually on their own and then talk to their neighbors and answer again. And then Q2 would be um, different organism, different phenotypes, um, different recombination frequency in this case. So you can imagine we could have gamed this whole thing too, right? We could have asked much easier questions for Q2 instead of Q1 and come up with an outcome that wasn't really reflective of what was going on. So what we did is we wrote all the questions ahead of time and then just right before class, we flipped a coin to determine which question was Q1 versus Q2. So here we go again. So we had students answer Q1 individually, talk to their neighbors and answer the question again. So we went from Q1 to Q1 AD. Then students answered a different question individually, Q2. And Q2 again is asking about the same concept as Q1. And so then when it was all said and done and we were all done com um, collecting data, we displayed the histograms of the student answers and had the instructor explain the answers to students. So I want to stress that all the way from Q1 to Q2, the only inputs the students were getting were in conversations that they had with each other. So no input back from the instructor. So my question to you guys, and you can work with your neighbors to figure it out, what do you think we saw when we compare this Q2 to Q1 AD? So I didn't bring clickers with me, I didn't haul them out. So we'll do hand signal clickers. So talk to each other, predict what uh, we got, and we'll vote on it here in just a second. How's everybody feeling? They think they've got the right predictions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three, and then we'll hold up. So if you want answer A, you put up a one, B, two, C, three, and I'll see the variation, and then maybe a few people would be willing to shout out what their neighbor was thinking about this whole thing. Okay, so um, everybody ready with their answer? I'll count to three. So one, two, three, vote. Okay, interesting, quite a range. Okay. 
So anybody brave enough to tell me about the discussion that they were having with their neighbors? You can just volunteer what your neighbor said. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any prediction what you thought? Uh, well, I think they would have learned some kind of the discussion and so it would go to, I'm sorry, B. You are, you're going to go for B, roughly equivalent, right? Okay, great. Other thoughts? And support, different ideas? Yes? They copied my neighbor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. What did your neighbor think? <laughs> three. Three. And why three? <laughs> now you can put your neighbor on the spot. Perfect. Any thoughts? No? Okay, yeah. So I would have liked an option that said oh. better than Q1, but maybe not as good as Q1 AD. Okay, so you I wanted the in-between. Based on the options, I would have said C, Okay. but not simply because all had copied. They learned some, but they were still a little uneasy if they fully had it because there was no further discussion. Okay. All right, so for next year, we should have, and yeah. <laughs> this is what I often do in the class, is right. Oh, yes, that's a good idea. Next time. Okay, great. Other thoughts? Oh, sorry. Yes. I picked three just because I teach genetics. And yeah. When I give a question on a concept that we've covered in class, almost 75% of my students will come up to me and say, we never covered this in class. Okay. <laughs> Okay, all right, great, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yep, that's true. So I will, this study was done in one class. I'll go on to tell you about studies that were done in multiple classes. So you're absolutely right. Um, so it was early days of clickers being used, but it was part of the culture, so it was something that was used throughout the entire semester, so it's a good question. Any other thoughts here? Okay, you guys ready for the big reveal? Yes. All right, let's see, <laughs> let's see who did it. Oops, am I going there? Okay, here we go. So here's what we found. So in fact, Q2 was slightly higher than Q1 AD, which suggested to us that in fact, the students were learning something from each other because that's the only input they had in this experience. So after we started talking about this more and putting this out there, we would present it to um, groups of faculty much like yourselves, faculty, postdocs, and graduate students, and people would say, oh, okay, that's a really nice study, but in fact, as an instructor, I skip peer discussion because my explanation to clicker questions is clearer and more informative than what the students will hear in conversations with each other. So in fact, hearing from me is much better than them talking to each other because they're going to say all kinds of wrong stuff and say it in weird ways and so they won't be able to learn from the experience. So at first we were annoyed by this, but then we thought, okay, this is a good point, so we should actually do a follow-up study. So what we did um, this next time is we sort of had a competition going. So which presentation mode leads to the greatest improvement in student performance? Having a peer discussion, what we just uh, showed you, listening to an instructor explanation, so the feedback we were getting from the audience, or um, engaging a peer discussion followed by an instructor explanation, and we'll just call this the combination. So the combination of having peer discussion plus an instructor explanation. So the way we did this study is very similar to the last. We had students answer a question individually. Again, that's going to be called Q1. And then we had um, three scenarios that were followed up. So either peer discussion, instructor explanation, or the combination of the two. So again, we followed the same thing where we would write the questions ahead of time. We would flip a coin to determine what was Q1 versus Q2. And in addition to that, just before class, we had a hat where we drew numbers one, two, or three. So we were determining which of these different protocols we were using. So we were at least trying to eliminate any bias we had in selecting um, certain types of discussions or not for the data analysis. Okay, so then students go on to answer Q2. 
So here's what I'm going to show you in just a second. This time the y-axis is learning gain, so we're measuring the gain in performance from Q1 to Q2. Learning gain is how much performance increases divided by the possible increase. So the higher um, the number, the more the students gain from Q1 to Q2. And here's what we found, and we did this in a variety of classes and saw the same effect. I'm just going to show you one of the majors genetics classes here. So in fact, um, students are learning uh, from their peers about it the same way they would learn um, from an instructor explanation, but you can really see that this combination makes a huge difference. And a lot of the thinking about this combination comes from the field of cognitive psychology. So there's this whole thinking about preparation for future learning. The fact that even in a lot of your lives, you have to struggle through and think about things, and then you're finally ready for the explanation, or you're finally ready to read that paper or consider this evidence. And in fact, by letting our students kind of work through it, um, we're providing them that chance to practice and think about things, and then be ready to listen to you in the classroom. Now, one other thing we often hear is that active learning is only for the bottom students, right? These are the only ones that really are benefiting from this thing. In fact, the combination approach, while effective for all different types of students, was the most effective for the top students in the class. And we think that this chance to wrestle um, with the material was really helping to engage them both as thinkers and teachers to those around them. So just in conclusion, really quickly, uh, comprehensive meta-analysis indicates that student learning is increased and the dropout rate is decreased in STEM courses that use active learning instructional approaches, that students are learning from talking to their peers during clicker questions, and when students talk about questions with their peers and then hear an instructor explanation, learning can be increased still further. So I'll just uh, thank very, uh, many of my colleagues who have participated in these studies. I think one of the most fun things about doing this line of work is that you get to work with all kinds of different biologists and cognitive psychologists and educators, and it's a really a fun space to be in. So thanks so much, and I'll answer any questions and turn it over to the next person. Thank you. Yeah, so at this point, we were really doing sort of broad brushstrokes looking at quantitative skills. There's been some more recent work that's been looking at the role of teaching in these conversations, and they find that it really depends on the types of questions students are asking each other. So when they are sort of engaging in this opening question, can you explain that to me? I don't really know where you got that. What evidence are you using? We see the student scores go up even higher. Um, and so part of that is thinking about how you should train your students to talk to each other during clicker questions. So can you get them to sort of engage in this cognitive process? Um, you'll see gains uh, likely even further. Other questions? Okay. Other questions? Great. Rachel. Thank you. Hi, welcome. I'm Rachel Horak. I'm currently at the American Society for Microbiology um, as a headquarters fellow in the education department. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the microbiology concept inventories, which are new tools to, to assess conceptual learning in your microbiology class. First, I want to state that this is a huge collaborative effort sponsored by the ASM education department. And we are uh, developing two different concept inventories for two different audiences. And I will talk about the audiences later. But uh, we have two awesome leaders that are listed here and uh, a few um, very large teams. So I want to recognize my collaborators. Here's an outline of my talk. First, we're going to talk about what is a concept inventory. Next, why does a 23 question multiple choice test take well over two years to develop. What is an example question? And we are going to do an activity because that's way more fun than listening to me talk. And how and when can you use the microbiology concept inventories? 
Okay. So let's talk about what is a concept inventory. This is a specific tool, and that is a jargony word. So let's learn about what a concept inventory is. First, um, let's think about this question. How do you know what your students know? For that, we use assessment. This quote from David Ausubel, who is a researcher in science ed learning and educational psychology. Let's think about this for a second. The most important single factor influencing learning is what the learner already knows. Ascertain what the student knows and teach them accordingly. But I like to think of misunderstandings and teach them accordingly. So this was um, discussed in this book, Mapping Biology Knowledge. Ascertain what the student misunderstands and teach them accordingly. So that's the pathway that concept inventories take. They are assessment tools that identify student misunderstandings and important scientific concepts. First, let me talk about what they are not. Okay. They are not designed to be an assessment for a grade, so they are not high stakes tests. And they're also not example test questions for quizzes or for homeworks. If you're interested in this, you can try the ASM sample questions in biology through the ASM Press, and you can speak to me afterwards if you want to know more or go to the ASM Press booth. So again, these are not tests that you give for a grade, and you cannot take questions from them, lift them, and give them to your students for um, example homework questions. They're also not tests to measure recall of facts. They are conceptually based. And they're not created overnight. Like I said, we've, they've been in development for over two years, and we still have another at least six to eight months to go. So what is a concept inventory? This is a quote from a paper. It's a research-based instrument that measures students' conceptual misunderstandings of topics for which students share common misconceptions and faulty reasonings. They are instruments and tools to show learning gains. You can give them pre-test, uh, pre-course, and post-course to determine if there are learning gains. They can measure deeper conceptual understanding in their biology thinking. And they also yield data for basic biology research. It's, all concept inventories are sets of multiple choice questions. And this set must be administered together without alterations because significant research has gone into administering the um, questions as they are given as a set. The answer choices are distractors and based on research. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that right now. So the um, answer choices that the students are given are misconceptions. Misconceptions are often personal beliefs uninformed by science about how the world works. And they're very resistant to instruction, so they're really useful for um, teaching them the proper scientific concept. You have to know what those misconceptions are in order to teach them correctly. In the concept, in the concept inventory, the wrong answers are misconceptions. Okay, So let's say there's four answer choices in the multiple choice question, and one of them is correct. The other three are called distractors, and they are based on the most frequent misconceptions um, based on research, and the words from the distractors are in the student's own words and free of jargon. And this is very important that the students don't pick out one answer choice because it's jargony. They diagnose a specific level of student, student conceptual understanding, and they clearly reveal where students are getting stuck. So I'm going to give you one example of a concept inventory question from the concept inventory for um, natural selection. You will see an example question for the microbiology later. In the finch population, what are the primary changes that occur gradually over time? So this is going to be an audience participation. Everybody read the uh, answer choices there. And you'll notice that all of our answer choices are written without jargon and they are written in the student's own words, and they are based on significant research. Okay. So here we have one, two, three, four. You ready to um, use your hands to display which answer is correct? Okay, all right, on three, ready? One, two, three, go. Yes, that's right, okay. So it turns out that um, this concept inventory uh, shows that this question is um, very frequently missed, Okay. Students do not realize the idea of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium without jargon and without equations. Okay. 
There are lots of other bio, there are lots of other concept inventories. The first was the force concept inventory in physics. This uh, deals with Newtonian physics. Um, there's also biology literacy, genetics concept, um, lac operon, which was just published, and the host pathogen interactions concept inventory. And if you're interested, there's a full list of biology concept inventories at this website. Um, you'll notice that microbiology, uh, general microbiology, is not included on this list because we're still, this is what we're talking about. So the force concept inventory has been used to transform the way physics is taught in the U.S. There was this great um, discussion of an a award-winning lecture at an Ivy League institution. Um, they said, oh, my students know Newtonian physics. Of course they're going to pass this concept inventory stellar because they're stellar students and I'm a great lecturer. And he gave the concept inventory and they bombed. And he found out it was because the students were memorizing equations instead of understanding the underlying concepts um, of, of the uh, test instead. So why are we developing a microbiology concept inventory? Well, we, uh, there's not one, so there's a niche. And second, um, we really want to assess the learning of the ASM curriculum guidelines for undergraduate microbiology. So these curriculum guidelines were published in 2012, and they are key concepts and skills central to any microbiology undergraduate curriculum from freshman through senior. And um, they are meant to be all-inclusive of all microbiology concepts taught at the undergraduate level. They're uh, included are 27 fundamental statements, and you see one example there. That's an evolution concept. They include seven lab skills and four scientific thinking skills. And these were based on the Vision and Change report. Our concept inventories are based on the 27 fundamental statements, and they um, together uh, assess all of the 27 fu fundamental statements. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the process. Why does the multiple choice test take more than two years to develop? So concept inventories can be known as million dollar instruments. Um, ours, a couple of order of magnitude uh, dollars less that was put into it. But if you count all the man hours to, um, working on this concept inventory, we're, we're talking a good amount of money has been spent on these concept inventories. Another thing that takes a long time is the agreement of concepts and then the um, institutional review board approval. So um, unlike doing uh, work with E. coli or staff, you do have to get approval from the IRB in order to do this experiment because this is human subjects research. And this does, a, this does include a significant amount of time and effort on the researcher's part. These uh, concept inventories are also uh, subject to several rounds of pre and, course pre and post course testing. Um, and the duration of um, one testing cycle is a term. Okay, which either is a semester or a quarter. So that means that we have to repeat the experiment several terms. It's also backed by evidence and psychometric research, which does take time. So here's the basic process that we follow. Uh, first, uh, the first thing that we did was we identified concepts to assess, and that was actually fairly easy because we took the ASM curriculum guidelines. Next, we wrote learning outcomes things that we really wanted our students to know. And we have, um, uh, let's see, um, we have 15 different institutions uh, included on this concept inventory. So uh, if you can imagine bringing 15 different professors together and agreeing on what concepts to assess was kind of a challenge. And then we have this whole cycle of revising, um, writing our questions, getting the IRB approval, collecting the data, and the coding of data analysis statistics. Okay, so repeat that cycle several semesters. And once we finally get enough uh, data, then we release the concept inventory and then we'll publish it. Okay. So again, this is backed by evidence and psychometric research, and so these are the three specific things that we're really looking forward, that we're really trying to make sure that our test um, has. First, we want it to be reliable. We want to assess whether the concept inventory gives reproducible results. So we give it several times at many different institutions. Next, we want to make sure, sure that it's valid, and we want to assess whether the concept inventory tests whether we want, what we want it to. Lastly, we want to make sure that it does not discriminate based on demographics. So we want to make sure that outcomes for the different demographics are very similar. For instance, we don't want our native English speakers to have different outcomes than native 
I'm sorry, we don't want our native English speakers having different outcomes than our English language learners. Next, um, let me show you what an example question is and we're going to do an activity. Okay. So uh, one example, a uh, fundamental statement um, is, while microscopic eukaryotes, for example, fungi, protozoa, and algae, carry out some of the same processes of bacteria, many of the cellular properties are fundamentally different. So this is one of the 27 fundamental statements in the ASM curriculum guidelines. We made a learning outcome based on this fundamental statement of explain why eukaryotic cells need and have organelles, why bacteria and archaea cells generally do not. So the first step um, for question writing is we write a true-false question. And the true-false question based on this learning outcome was organelles are the site of respiration and photosynthesis for both eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. So at this point, I'm going to ask Lee, can you help me out? I'm going to have some helpers to help um, pass out some uh, activity worksheets. Okay. And they'll also be coming around to help you out with this process. And you're more than welcome to work with a, um, a neighbor for this uh, activity. And uh, here's some instructions here. And there's also instructions on your handout. So we're going to go through a coding exercise. And your handout contains free responses, word for word, taken from the student for that uh, true-false question that I just showed you about prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells and organelles. You're going to identify three misconceptions. You're going to identify answers that are nonsense and correct answers. And then finally, retaliate your responses in codebook. I'm going to give you mm, about eight to ten minutes to work on this, uh, either by yourself or with a neighbor, and we'll come around and please do ask us if you have questions.
You have one more minute. Okay, we're going to get back together. Okay. Can I have a volunteer to um, jump up and shout? What is one misconception that they saw in this coding activity? Right, so some kind of confusion that prokaryotes don't have organelles. <laughs> right. What's another misconception that you saw? Yes? If they don't, they must not do that activity. That's right. So there's some kind of confusion as what kind of metabolism eukaryotes and prokaryotes do. Okay. What is one more misconception that you saw? It's about a word that starts with a C. Cytoplasm, yeah. Okay, where um, respiration photosynthesis occur. Okay, so you should have this in your code book or something that looks like it. You should have found two correct answers, two nonsense answers, and I think you know exactly what one of them is. Like my mom is a microbiologist, and I learned this from her. <laughs> okay, we actually this is taken word for word from the students for why this answer is correct. And sometimes they're wrong. <laughs> okay, and the misconception, it doesn't have to be, you know, the, the order of what your misconceptions are, one, two, three, doesn't matter. But you should have counted up three total responses for each of the three misconceptions. Okay. So when we did this, um, we did this for data taken in 2015. And this was um, in general microbiology course four majors, and we had 440 responses, and this was one example question of 27 that we had. So we had a lot of coding to do, and we had a lot of uh, trying to interpret what, you, what students were trying to say. These are the uh, misconceptions that we came up with from the students. You can see the top three are here is what you saw. Here's our revised questions with the distractors. We took the top misconceptions and made them the distractors, the wrong answers. And our correct answer is underlined here. So again, our top misconception is the C. The eukaryotes um, and prokaryotes have the same structures for photosynthesis and respiration. Okay. So this is one example question from the general microbiology concept inventory. And it's going to look exactly like this word for word when it comes out. So how and when can you use the microbiology concept inventories? So again, like I was saying, they, they're going to come in two different flavors no, um, for, for two different audiences. Okay? The first one is the microbiology concept inventory, and this is general microbiology for majors. The prerequisite um, that we anticipate is that the students will have already had introductory biology before they get into your course. In the spring of 2016, we tested this at nine institutions, and you can see the institution distribution by Carnegie classification over on the right. We had over 1,000 students participate in this testing. And you can notice that doctoral universities with highest research activity, that's um, University of Maryland, Virginia Tech, and Wisconsin-Madison were huge. We had tons of students because they have large lecture classes. 
The second microbiology concept inventory is for the health sciences. And this is for allied health students that have not taken biology before, primarily at community colleges, but also at lots of other universities. We've tested it at four institutions, with over 200 students. And these are the three types of institutions that we have tested it this year. How can you use these in your own classes? Well, first is you can do it for non-research and personal uses. So you can do pre-course, post-course testing to check for course breadth and alignment with the ASM curriculum guidelines. You can also identify student weak spots and their conceptual understandings. The second, and this is coming from the host pathogen work, um, the host pathogen concept inventory, they've done a lot of work of identifying gaps in the microbiology curriculum based on students' performance in the concept inventory. You can also support faculty reflection on teaching using real evidence of performance of the students. The third purpose you could use it for is for deeper or discipline-based education research. So for this, you can use the tool to assess effectiveness of learning interventions, but remember to do this, you do have to have IRB approval um, for all human subjects research. Well, we will not have this available for uh, widespread distribution until 2016, and there's really important reasons of why we're making you wait. Um, and when I proposed, uh, when I was asked to give this talk, we thought that it, they would be ready, but it turns out that it takes way more time than we thought to develop them because of all of this um, psychometric and evidence research. So it needs another round of testing, and we're also preparing the method of distribution. So starting in the spring 2017 term, you can contact the concept inventory leaders of the, um, the particular concept inventories if you're interested in their email addresses are listed there. You can also see me afterwards for more information. So again, I'm just gonna finalize, uh, finish my talk by again acknowledging my huge amount of co-authors. They're all awesome and fun to work with. Um, thank you very much. Time for one question. Thank you for the talk. Is there something intrinsic about the questions why we shouldn't use them for tests for grading? Or is it just something that you don't want people to use it when they're validating them? Right. So concept inventories are not used for grading. They are meant to be low stakes tests. And the reason for this is we want to keep, we, we want to use them across the country and um, they're going to be reused for many years to come. So we do not want any kind of um, uh, motivation for students to copy and cheat and distribute these um, tests to their, to their peers, okay? So we give it as low stakes tests so they don't have a reason to cheat and distribute the test. So there's nothing pedagogical about using misconceptions in multiple choice questions. You know, there's nothing in that sense that way we shouldn't use them. Or perhaps this is the way in which we should be making multiple choice questions using misconceptions as, as options. Okay, the way I understand what you're saying is no, there's no pedagogical reason. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Samantha Elliott and while we're waiting for this to load, uh, I'll just introduce myself quickly. I am an Associate Professor of Biology at St. Mary's College of Maryland and I am also the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Microbiology and Biology Education. And that's primarily um, the role in which I'm here presenting to you today. So my talk is gonna be a little bit different than, than the ones previously, and, and I hope it's going to end up being sort of a call for action of, of where we need to go with um, thinking about some of the things we do in the classroom in terms of teaching ethics to our students. Um, so the question that I wanna entertain during the session is can we teach ethical behavior? So let me tell you the plan about where, where we're gonna go on this journey. Um, the first thing we're going to do is do get, get a little bit negative, but not for long. Uh, we're going to talk about current uh, statistics in research misconduct. 
We're going to explore why research misconduct occurs. And then I'm going to give you guys a, a little bit of context for this by talking about the American Academy of Microbiology colloquium that happened this past fall about these sorts of problems and give you kind of a preliminary view of what they found. Then we're going to delve a little bit into some social science. We're going to pretend to be psychologists for a little bit and uh, consider the development of ethical <coughs> thinking in a specific group of people in emerging adults. Um, and the reason why I'm cho cho choosing this age group is this tends to be the age of students in both undergraduate and graduate <coughs> school. So most of the students that we are teaching. And then we're going to see how we can adapt this to our own biological sciences education. So, t so borrow these tools from the social scientists and bring them into our own classrooms. So first, what I'd like to do is actually define research, re research misconduct. There are many reasons why science, um, even after it gets published, um, that, that, that things go wrong with the system. Um, we're humans. There's human error. Okay, so a full 28% of um, problems with published data tend to be just kind of human error types of things. Maybe also there are ir irreproducible results, not because of fraud or anything else, but just because different circumstances, different situations. Um, the real problems in misconduct and, and the definition of, of misconduct that I'm using are true fabrication or falsification of data and plagiarism, either plagiarism of others or self-plagiarism. And this, in, uh, according to this graphic, accounts for just roughly half of, of misconduct cases. Now, the data that I'm going to show you about statistics of misconduct come from a series of papers um, by our own Arturo Casadevall, who is editor-in-chief of MBio and Farrakh Fang, who is editor-in-chief of um, Infection and Immunity, as well as some of their colleagues. And so I'm, I'm going to pull some figures from their papers to, to give you an idea of the current state of research misconduct. And so this came from a paper um, in 2012 from PNAS. And what it's showing is the number of cases over a course of decades from 1977 through about 2011. And as you see, the number of cases have drastically increased since about the early 2000s. The majority of these um, tend to be <laughs> So these, the, sorry, let me, let, me, let me step back for a minute. These are cases of fraud or suspected fraud in life sciences journals, English language life sciences journals. They did a search of um, these articles through PubMed. Okay. And as you can see from the 2007 to 2011 um, bars there at, at the very right, we have a very drastic increase in not only the amount of just human error, the blue bar, but cases of plagiarism, as well as what they call duplicate publication. Now, duplicate publication, a lot of times, tends to be image manipulation. And it's where um, pictures or data sets are used um, and duplicated either within the same paper or within separate papers and attributed as being completely different data sets. And if you want to know more information about th that particular type of problem, um, Arturo and Farrakh and colleagues have actually just published a paper in MBio that came out this month that shows specific examples of that. And it's, it is the kind of largest growing area of misconduct within, within these uh, cases. When we look at where these things are happening, right? Often people go, oh, well, this is a problem, but it's a problem in other countries. It's not a problem for my country, wherever your country is, okay? Turns out, it's happening all over the place. This, this is a global problem. We cannot point fingers at any one country, at any certain culture. This, this is very widespread. So 
this is this this is all here to basically posit that yes, we have a problem with research integrity in the life sciences, and it's getting worse. And there's no reason to think that it's going to drop off anytime soon, unless we do a major culture shift. So how did we get here? There's a new paper that came out in Nature about two weeks ago from Dubois and colleagues. And what they have been doing, um, this is based out of a program from uh, Washington University in St. Louis. It's called the PI program, also informally called Researcher Rehab. Okay? So nobody you know, wants to go to this, but they've had about uh, 39 participants since, since 2013. And these are researchers who have been uh, found guilty of certain research misconduct, about 40, about half of them, 40, 49%. Um, a failure to provide oversight, leading to problems with their science. Um, for many, it, it's concerning things um, with their research program in terms of human participants or animal care violations. About 21% plagiarism and 13% data fabrication, falsification, or substandard research leading to false data. So what I'd like you to consider just, just for 30 seconds, I'd, I'd like to talk to, for, for you to talk to a neighbor. These are the reasons why these participants go to the program, okay? Then during the program, they really sit and think about how they got here. What, what were the main things that happened that led to the problem of, of this, this misconduct? So talk to your neighbor, try to figure out why you think the researchers got to this point. What are the most common things? Okay, I bet we've come up with some really good ideas. So does anyone want to be brave and, uh, and, and shout out? What do you think? How did they get there? Oh, come on, somebody. Don't make me call on names. I know plenty of you in the audience. Yes? Pressure to publish. Pressure to publish, okay. Pressure to publish. What else? Cutting funding. Cutting funding. Any others? Vague guidelines. Hmm? Vague guidelines. Vague guidelines. Okay. All right. You ready to see? Seventy-two percent lack of attention because they are overextended, not detail-oriented, or distracted by other things. Uh, about f just over 50% either, so going back to the vague guidelines kind of thing, being unsure of the rules, maybe the rules have changed over the years, an increase in regulations, um, or a lack of mentoring going into a new project and not understanding what the norms are for, for that um, type of, of research, as well as some cultural differences. Others, frankly, just did not prioritize compliance as being that important. Uh, the quote from, from this paper says, well, you know, before this, I followed the spirit of the law, so I thought. Now I'm going to follow the letter of the law. Right? Surprisingly, um, things like ambition, being very driven, wanting to publish, needing to publish for promotion, needing to get funding, only 21% of the case. Um, and one of, one of the other things that, um, f well, what was the other one that, that, that came out? I'm blanking now, because I'm standing up here in front of a big room of people. Funding, funding. Um, this, this, this is only about half of, of the graphic from the paper. Funding was actually, was there, but it was surprisingly low. Surprisingly low. So think about it, 72% um, lack of attention. How many of us in this room are overextended right now? 
Raise your hand. Okay? This could be any of us. Right? So there's this idea that people who are found guilty of research misconduct are the bad guys. They're the ones that with ambition and they're really there trying to get ahead, to get that funding, to publish, right? The vast majority, that's not true, okay? And it's, it's usually things like lack of oversight. Okay, so the American Academy for Microbiology held a colloquium um, this past fall of 2015. It was, and it was on data reproducibility in the biological sciences. There will be a full written report available in the next few months. There is a draft for those that are part of the um, American Academy for Microbiology. Apparently in the, in the lounge there, there, there is a draft that people can see. Um, and there is a flyer with the summary recommendations from this report that is here at this meeting, so, so take a look. Um, to find that. There are two recommendations that came out of this, and, and, th and this was a wide-ranging conversation, things about talking about the culture of science to things in terms of publications and, and things that I, I'm not going to talk about today, but there are two directly related to education that I would like to focus on. The first recommendation is to require universal training in good scientific practices and appropriate statistical usage for researchers at all levels with training content updated regularly and presented by qualified scientists, okay? And I highlighted the key words in here, okay? Universal training at all levels, updated regularly. The second recommendation is to strengthen research integrity, oversight, and training, okay? So as educators, we need to think about this and how we're going to do this within our own classrooms. And it doesn't matter if you're teaching at a community college, at a, a baccalaureate institution, at the graduate level, or even if you only have postdocs. There are opportunities at all of those levels to really get into the cult, like to, to get into an ethical culture of science. Okay. So when I ask folks, can we teach our students ethical behavior? If I ask biologists this, this is a totally unscientific study, this is me just, you know, asking my friends, right? For the biologists, it usually comes into one of two camps. The first camp goes, well, yeah, I guess we can, right? And the other says, well, I can model good science and I can teach good science, but people are either ethical or they're not. Okay? When I ask social scientists and philosophers can we teach students ethical behavior? They look at me like I have two heads and they go, of course we can. Okay, so there's a bit of disconnect between the disciplines as to what can be done. So the next part of the talk, <laughs> stand back, I'm gonna try to do a little bit of social science. Now, bear in mind, I am not a content expert. I am an immunologist by training. Okay, so the good news is I am right here, right here with, with you guys. Hopefully I've distilled down the information into some form that everyone can use, okay? All right, so first we need to think about moral development in people, right? How people come to understand what is ethical and what is not. So moral identity and moral development increases in complexity with age. Okay, so when we're very young, we're talking, you know, ages two to six, we're focused very much on our individual needs. So I shouldn't do this because I'm gonna get punished by my parents. Okay, that's generally the, the, the moral standard at that point. From ages about six to 15, individuals become aware of societal norms, what it means to be a good person. I should do this because I want to be seen as a good person. Or we have certain laws and rules and regulations for society that I need to follow. Okay? And um, science has shown that every individual usually gets through, through, through those two levels. That, that, that's very common. What's a little more debated is this next phase of internalized reasoning. So going beyond just societal norms and really having a moral identity where in this stage people look for opinions from people from a wide variety of 
uh, cultures and, and, and moral issues before coming to some sort of consensus, or even deeply ingraining their own moral identity such that they're willing to go against societal norms when they feel that it, it, it doesn't fit the particular situation. We also know that people can view moral issues using different domains or lenses. So if you ask somebody to reason out a situation as an individual, they may give you a different answer than if they're talking about for their own community or society, or if they're religious through a religious lens of values and beliefs within that system. And lastly, we know that just because someone thinks a certain way, the behavior does not necessarily match that thinking. And that's because moral or ethical behavior is a combination of cognition, of thinking, as well as emotion. And as we know, human emotions get messy. Okay. So what do we know about our students in this kind of emerging adulthood model? Now, emerging adulthood is a fairly new concept within psychology. It used to be that we considered people to be adults at 18, okay? And back 100 years ago, they definitely would be. They would own their own place, they'd be married, they'd have a bunch of kids, right? They, they, they would be assuming adult roles. That doesn't happen that much anymore, at least in industrialized countries, right? So emerging adulthood is not something that we see globally but we often see it here in, in the United States and other industrialized countries. So it's defined as the third decade of life, between, ages between 20 and 29, where these, not quote, they're, they're not as adolescents anymore, they're kind of young adults. Um, they delay marriage, parenthood, and other traditional adult roles. And it's defined by many different features mostly exploring their own identity. They're often on their own for the first time. They're not under their parents' roof anymore, at least we hope. And um, they're figuring out who they are because they are away from the culture and the cultural norms that they've been in all through their childhood and adolescence. So there's often a lot of self-focus of improving themselves at this time. There is some instability and feeling in between. They don't have um, a lot of those defining features, again, of marriage and parenthood. They may not have a steady job. They may be moving around a lot for work or being in a lot of travel. So this creates instability, but it also creates, creates some amazing possibilities. At this age, our students are more than willing to drop everything and go volunteer in Africa for months or years, for example, right? You can, they, can, they can go out and do some very life-changing things that people who do have those ties cannot do. And so the reason why this is important is to understand that because identity exploration is still happening, ethical and moral identity is still occurring at this age. So from the beginning of the major, from when they choose to be a microbiologist or a biologist, and they're taking those introductory classes through graduate work and postdoctoral training, what I hope to convince you all of <coughs> is that educators are the gatekeepers of research integrity. We are the first stop. We are where they start to learn the norms of our scientific culture. And if ethics are not prominent within that, we're doing them a disservice. So how can we teach ethical behavior in biology education? Typically, when, when you look at ethics training, so um, I'm sure most of us are aware of the kind of yearly mandate of you, you, you must go through ethics training at least once a year if you have um, government grant funding. Sometimes it's rule-based, right? You shall do this or shall not do that, okay? And it's important to, to, to know the rules, definitely. Sometimes it's case-based. I find this, this very often in, in that yearly training. Okay? There are certain scenarios that prompt discussion. Often these things are probably a little more black and white than is typical for true misconduct cases within the sciences. 
Sometimes there's theory-based ethics, usually um, in connection with a specific class, so a scientific ethics class for a semester. Okay, so the good news on this is that students can learn different lenses or viewpoints and, and, and theories behind ethics, but it can seem abstract if it's not taught with the, 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 the real life scenarios as well. The best case and the eventual thing where our students need to be is in a reasoning-based ethics curriculum where students are able to take what they know and apply them to new situations because ethical considerations are changing over time very, very rapidly, particularly in the sciences. Let's use CRISPR for example, okay? That was not on our horizon five, ten years ago. Now, there are major ethical debates on how should it be used, when should it be used, should it be used at all, okay? Things change over time and we need to be able to adapt to those changes and reasoning-based education will let us do that. So what I'd like to introduce now is an acculturation model of learning about scientific ethics. And what I like about this model and why I pulled this is because it accounts for the ethical identity of the person as they walk in the door. Okay? We all come in with certain expectations and certain norms, but then it also shows how it interacts with the ethics of the discipline. In this case, it says psychology, just insert biology in that. Okay? It doesn't matter. Whatever the norms or, or <laughs> ethics of, of the discipline in question. In an ideal world, our students would have, would maintain their high ethical um, identity, their, their personal ethical identity, but then also integrate the ethics of the biological sciences, what they should do as a scientist, okay? This way they don't lose themselves, but they also adopt the expectations of the discipline. If a student comes in with a fairly low personal ethics of, of origin, they don't have that ethical identity, this does create problems. If both disciplinary ethics and personal ethics are low, we get something called marginalization, and that generally means they just don't think it's important, right? And that's probably the worst case scenario. Now you would think if they have a low personal um, ethics identity, but at least highly identify with the disciplinary ethics, that that would be a good thing, right? But in this case, what we tend to get is assimilation, a blind following of the so-called rules. And that can lead to problems, especially when things change. It, it can lead to an inflexibility when there are ethical dilemmas, um, which may not work so well. The last idea is if a person maintains their, their high ethical identity but does not really adopt the, dis, the disciplinary ethics. And, th and what happens here is separation. And so the person will put their own moral code into decisions about disciplinary ethics. How well that works is going to, to, to depend on just how far their own personal, personal ethics are compared to the, di to the disciplinary ethics, okay? And definitely just how far of a shift it is as someone's coming into a new culture compared to their own old cultural ide or ethical identity will determine just how well these things mesh. So how can we implement ethical acculturation of students in the biological sciences? There are some best practices that, that, that we can consider for this. The first and foremost is focusing on the positive, right? The whole reason for teaching ethics is because we want our students to be their, the best possible scientists they can be, and that means being an ethical scientist. If it's focused, if, if the training is just focused on rules, don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other thing, otherwise you're going to get into big trouble, this can lead to assimilation, right? Which again is not ideal. Ethics is definitely a lifelong learning process. As I said before, there are complex and changing situations. 
And it's very important to use real life examples, specifically applicable to the level of the student, because the ethics that an undergraduate or graduate student are gonna face, right, these certain dilemmas or scenarios, are gonna be quite different than what a PI could face. And so we need to tailor this, 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 this education to be appropriate for the level, and again, it's a lifelong learning. And these scenarios and case-based things should be ambiguous or emotionally charged because that's real life. And the way that, that we're gonna get through this is to be able to have a safe, comfortable place to discuss these, these sorts of things and come to a consensus as a group. So in conclusion, we currently need a cultural shift in the biological sciences towards greater research integrity. Undergraduate and graduate educators have a large impact on the ethical training of new biologists. Acculturation models may help us frame ethics education, although there are many other models out there. And the use of positive discussion-based ethics training that incorporates real-life scenarios tailored to the career stage of the scientist our best. Now, for those that want to start thinking about this and using this in their own classrooms, there are numerous sources out there to help you. The source survey, the Survey of Organizational Research Climate, is one, it's, it's the only vetted um, survey that you can determine the research integrity climate of your organization. Okay. Ethics Core, ORI, and COPE as well as PubPeer, are all different uh, resources where there are case studies and tools and things to use to bring real life scenarios into the classroom. And as I said, I'm Jimby editor in chief, so I would be remiss if I didn't plug our first themed issue on scientific ethics came out in December 2014 and there are many, many resources in there as well. And with that, I'll take any questions. Uh-oh, Lee's going to ask a question. <laughs> well, I, I just, I, I, kind of thinking about all of this and, and the importance of, of that training, but what I see is I wonder if in, in some ways these mandatory trainings are counterproductive because they're setting a rule we need to follow, you must be trained, which just makes that kind of pushback of there's one more training I have to do and, and so that we really don't take it seriously. I, I... I agree with you, right? I mean, it's the, oh no, it's time for the mandatory ethics training and everybody troops into um, an auditorium or maybe it's an online sort of thing and they roll their eyes and they flip through um, the, the materials, what, whatever they are. Um, I, I do think there, there are ways to combat that. I think that um, the training is getting much better. Um, this isn't necessarily ethics, but for example, Title IX training, which many of us have, have also had to do in, in recent years. Um, the, people are realizing just how to get people to learn un, under these circumstances, and, and, and there are ways to make it better, again, with the tailoring, again, with, you know, okay, so there's formal one, you know, once a year training just to do, just to satisfy the, the grant funding. That doesn't mean that's all we have to do. This, this can be built in to graduate level courses, to undergraduate courses. It can be built into lab meetings and discussions. I mean, this, this needs to happen at multiple levels for people to understand its importance. Thank you, and I'm gonna take advantage of the microphone and remind everyone that there's the Division W meeting at, six, at 5.30 in room 206. That's right. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you again to all our speakers, and thank you for your attendance. Have a good evening. <laughs>